Good morning everyone, my name is Martina Toscani and I am a second year PhD student at University of Milano. With this talk I will illustrate the work done in collaboration with Elena Rossi and Giuseppe Lodato on the gravitational wave background of frontal disruption events. After a very small introduction, I will first describe tidal disruption events in general and their emission, and then I will show the results that we obtained in our last paper on the background from these events. Ok, let's start! We can say that now we are in the era of the multi-messenger astronomy, that is, a branch of astronomy that studies an astrophysical phenomenon through the combination of the information carried by different messengers. The first example in this field was the supernova explosion 1987A that was observed and studied both through electromagnetic waves and neutrinos. More recently, we have the neutron star merger GW170817 that was the first event ever to be observed through gravitational waves and electromagnetic radiation. The gravitational signal was detected by LIGO and Virgo, while the electromagnetic radiation was seen by some telescopes such as Fermi and Integral. Yet, we need to keep in mind that not only neutron star mergers emit both gravitational and electromagnetic radiation, but also other kinds of sources, such as tidal disruption events, TDEs. A TDE takes place when a star orbiting a black hole, usually the star is on a parabolic orbit, is disrupted by the black hole tides that overwhelm the stellar self-gravity. This occurs when the stellar pericenter is lower or equal to the tidal radius, which is the distance where the gravitational acceleration on the stellar surface due to self-gravity is approximately equal to the tidal field exerted on the star. The tidal radius, as you can see in the first equation, depends on the stellar radius R star, the stellar mass M star, and the black hole mass MBH. The strength of a tidal disruption event is usually quantified through a dimensionless parameter, the penetration factor beta, which is the ratio between the tidal radius and the pericenter, the stellar pericenter. Beta can range between a minimum value 1 that we get when the pericenter is equal to the tidal radius and a maximum value that we get when the pericenter is equal to the Svashi radius. Below the Svashi radius, the star is directly swallowed by the black hole. After the disruption, we have that around half of the stellar debris circularize and forms an accretion disk around the black hole. How can we detect tidal disruption events? Well, first of all, they are very luminous electromagnetic sources that can be even super Eddington. They are characterized by a light curve that, at later times, and at least in the soft X-ray band, is proportional to the time 2 minus 5 thirds. Up to now, around 50 events of this type have been observed in optical X-rays, gamma rays and radio. Moreover, tidal disruption events also emit gravitational waves, and in particular we have three different kinds, kinds of emission related to tidal disruption events. The one that is generated from the variation of the internal quadrupole of the star, while it is compressed and stretched by the black hole tides. The one that we get from the variation of the quadrupole of the star black hole system and the one that we get after the circularization of the debris around the hole. All being equal, we have that the signal from the variation of the quadrupole of the star black hole system is stronger 
and so we will focus on this kind of gravitational wave signal in the rest of the talk. This signal is a gravitational wave burst and, in good approximation, it is a monochromatic signal. So, just to give you some order of magnitudes of the gravitational wave burst that the black hole star system emits, if we consider a sun-like star disrupted by a 10 to 6 solar mass black hole at the distance of the Virgo cluster, we have that the gravitational strain is around 10 to minus 22, while the frequency is around the milliards. Instead, if we consider a white dwarf with a typical mass of 0.5 solar mass and a radius of 10 to minus 2 solar radius, disrupted by an intermediate mass black hole of mass 10 to 4 solar masses, always at the distance of the Virgo cluster, we get a very similar gravitational strain as in the previous case. The strain is around 10 to minus 22, but the frequency is higher, 10 to minus 2 hertz. Hence, the gravitational wave bursts generated during tidal disruption events are in the frequency band of LISA, but it is quite unlikely that LISA will be able to detect single tidal disruption events through gravitational waves. We should consider very high penetration penetrating events and very high stellar masses to have a tidal disruption event that maybe Lisa can see. For this reason, it is more interesting to study the gravitational wave signal generated by the entire cosmic population of tidal disruption event, that is, the gravitational wave stochastic background from tidal disruption event, and compare this signal with the sensitivity curve of LISA to see if LISA will be able to detect it, and also with the sensitivity curves of other interferometers that will work in the low frequency band, such as Tianqin, Alia, Desigo, and BBO. This study has been performed by Toscani et al. 2020. In particular, they study two different kinds of background. The one produced by mean sequence star disrupted by supermassive black holes. In this case, they assume that the supermassive black holes reside in the core of galaxies and so we can talk about nuclear tidal disruption events. And then they also study the gravitational wave background from white dwarfs disrupted by intermediate mass black holes in the range of 10 to 3, 10 to 5 solar masses. As a matter of fact, if we consider white dwarfs, we cannot take into consideration black hole with a mass higher than 10 to 5 solar masses because in that case the white dwarf would be directly swallowed by the black hole. In this case, they consider that the more likely environment for intermediate mass black holes are globular clusters, and so we can talk about globular tidal disruption events. They derive an analytical formula for the background that contains two key ingredients the number of sources per unit time per unit redshift and the gravitational wave energy per unit of rest frame frequency. They derive that the gravitational wave energy per unit of rest frame frequency is proportional both for main sequence stars and for white dwarfs to the square of the gravitational wave strain. And this is a consequence of the burst nature of the gravitational wave signal related to tidal disruption events, thanks to which we can approximate the Fourier transform of the strain as the ratio between the gravitational wave strain and the frequency of the signal. Instead, for the number of sources per unit time and per unit redshift, they rewrite this quantity in the case of main sequence stars in terms of the tidal disruption 
event rate per galaxy times the distribution of galaxy in the universe, while for white dwarfs they rewrite this quantity in terms of the tidal disruption event rate per globular clusters times a relation that expresses the number of globular clusters per galaxy, depending on some galaxy property, times the distribution of galaxy in the universe. In order to get sensible results, Toscani et al. made some assumption, for instance, which is the maximum redshift to consider during the calculation, which is the stellar mass range, how the tidal disruption events depends on the stellar mass and on the distribution of the penetration factor. Is there any relation between the number of Gobura clusters and some feature of the host galaxies, such as the mass of the supermassive black hole in the core of the galaxies? A detailed discussion on all these hypotheses is beyond the scope of this talk, so please, if you are interested in this discussion, have a look at Toscani et al. 2020. In this talk, I just want to illustrate the results that they get, in particular the results that they get in the most optimistic scenario. This result is illustrated in the figure that you can see on the slide, where you see there are the sensitivity curves of five different interferometers, Lisa, Tianqin, Alia, Desigo and BBO. On the left side of the plot, there is a green dashed line. This is the gravitational wave signal from main sequence stars disrupted by supermassive black holes. As you can see, this signal is too low to be detected by any planned interferometer in the low frequency band. It might just be revealed in the high frequency part by BBO. Instead, on the right side of the plot, you see a green area. This area represents the region where the gravitational wave background from white dwarfs can be. And, as you can see, this background is in reach of three interferometers, Alia, the Sigo and BBO. Thus, the background from white dwarfs disrupted by intermediate mass black holes seems to be a promising source for future interferometers. The detection of this background will give us information on the distribution of intermediate mass black holes up to redshift 3 and also on the occupation fraction of intermediate mass black holes inside globular clusters. The main result of Toscani et al. 2020 is the spectral shape of the gravitational wave background of tidal disruption events that they get, both for main sequence stars and white dwarfs. They obtain that this signal is proportional to the frequency to minus one half. This result is a consequence of their choice of the index in the beta distribution when considering the tidal disruption event rate. They take this index equal to minus 2. But it is also a consequence of the nature of the gravitational wave signal related to tidal disruption event, which is a monochromatic burst, and so we can express the Fourier transform of the strain as h over f. This spectral shape is different from the spectral shapes of the other sources that emit in the same frequency interval as tidal disruption events. So this result tells us that the gravitational wave background from tidal disruption event is easy distinguishable. With this summary slide, I finish my talk. Thanks.